this is the hand we made it. Whoa. I know you, if I asked you what was the most important man in the Bible for us, who would you say it is? Jesus. Oh, all right. All right. Now keep that in mind because I'm about to show you is going to definitely change your perspective. Because when I say, what's the most important man? That's when we have a challenge. Is it Jesus? Did he come for us? No. That's what everybody teaches. How many here got water baptized? Oh, yeah. Man, I got water baptized not once, twice, not twice. twice. Three times I've been water baptized. Now, there's, what does water baptism got to do with the Bible? Well, we're going to find out. We're going to find out a lot of great important things. But this man is a by far, I mean, every, everyone in the Bible is important. But this man is extraordinary. And I really, the first time I learned about him, I was like, wow. Now, there's Joseph of Arimathea, which is pretty cool, but I don't, it's hard to find enough background about him. But this person, if you do a lot of research, and you read a lot of books, so you learn about his environment, where he came from, how he, you know, his life, a lot. So I'm going to share it all with you. That's eight years of research I'm going to give to you. Wow. All right? And you're not going to, you're going to find pieces and pieces and bits, pieces, pieces and bits. Bits, bits and pieces of it throughout my books, right? So you have to go through a whole library to find all this stuff out, plus a lot of those books over there. Um, because we have to go back to the, four, the first century. And it's really hard to go back there and to see what goes on. So you find a little bit here. Like I got some from Plato. I got a little bit from Aristotle. I got a little bit from each one of the writers. So you can go and you can re-research this. It'll only take you about two years. And you'll be able to come up with the same conclusions. So before we get any further, so Father, thank you for this great privilege and honor of teaching your word and for blessing the hearts of your people to have them know the truth, to be able to see their own lives and the lives of others and their importance and value to you. Thank you for helping me to teach it and to truly lift them so that they can see their potential and truly glorify you as we walk in the footsteps of your firstborn from the dead are risen and return, Lord Jesus, your anointed. Okay, so I'm going to start off, which I usually should do. All right. <laughs> Focus on this part right here, okay? Focusing, everybody focusing? This is called the horn of fire. The what? The horn of fire. Now, you're probably wondering, how in the heck do we get a yes. horn of fire? Where is that in the Bible? Well, you'd be surprised. It's everywhere. But unless you understand the culture, the customs, and the terminologies, and you, and you don't grasp them, you're going to be just like you miss everything. So I'm going to make sure everything is visible for you. All right? So let's start off with this man here. He's an Anatolian. An Anatolian. Anatolian. He's very famous in the Bible. Anatolia is the place we call today Turkey. But it wasn't called Turkey back then. It was called Asia and Cyrenus, and you, I'm going to be going through that for you. So here we go. You're going to learn a lot about him. So right now, I just want you to keep in mind that he's an Anatolian from Turkish descent, what we call Turkey. We're going to move him down here. I'm going to stay there for a while as we go through. <laughs> we go through some interesting things. Now, how many ever heard John the Baptist, right? Okay. Now, he went out in the wilderness. There's no water out there. Isn't that weird? So what we get in here is that there is water, but not like we think it is, like we think of running water. We always just walk over there and you know flush our toilets, and there goes five gallons of water, and we go over here and just run our water. Well, in the Bible culture, water was very scarce. I mean, like really, really, really scarce. So you have to understand... As you can see, there's an all abundance of water. No, there isn't. <laughs> and drinking water was very scarce. And when you look at the sea, you notice that, was it, 80% of the, of the whole world is covered by water? So why is everybody having a water problem? 
because it's not salt water we can drink, it has to be fresh water. And that's less than 7% of the world. So we really have a shortage of water. And in the Bible lands, which is the Palestinian area, there's like little water, like you can tell. So when people talk about getting baptized in the wilderness, it's like, okay, how much water did he really take with him? But I'd rather not go into that right now. But anyway, one of the things that John the Baptist said in Matthew 3, 7, 11, now this is an important statement because Jesus also repeats it. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits met for your repentance. Now, I know how many, when you see that word vipers, you've got an idea of what they're like. <sighs> right? Little bangs, right? But that's not what it's talking about. This is not how we think of vipers. This is vipers in the Bible lands. All right? When you call someone a viper, it has nothing to do with them being vicious and you know, nasty and biting you. That's not what a viper is. That's what this means. You have no parents, no one to teach you. Now, if it talks about a cockatrice or whatever, that's a different story. But this is a, a viper, and it just means one brought up without any guidance. No one to direct it, no one to teach them, no one to help them learn. So it, basically, that's, that's what he's saying. Who, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And that's what vipers are. They have no one to guide them. No one. The, they, the, the vipers just lay their eggs and leave. And the snakes hatch out of their egg going, what is this? <laughs> Where am I? Right? You got that? Does that make sense? So the, when you see the word viper in the Bible, it doesn't mean that it's the nasty guys that hurt your feelings and your life. And, you know, it's talking about those who have never had anyone to bring them up. And the whole animal kingdom... There's nothing else you can say except vipers, because they're the ones that just lay their eggs and leave. And the poor babies crash out, and they get, they get, while they're small, they become food for everything. So there's nothing to protect them, nothing to give them instruction, and so they get wiped out. So that's why he says, O vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Who hath warned you? You had no one to oversee you. Now, does that make sense now? Okay, cool. Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meet for repentance. That means a change of direction, a, a new identity. Like, they go, repent. No, we're talking about change of identity. Just like you do when you were a child, you can holler away to your teenager, and then you get to be a teenager, you can holler away to your adult, and something like that. And once you're an adult, you don't go back to being a, a toddler. I mean, if you do, you got problems, right? All right, so therefore, he says, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say unto you, God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Is that important? Yes. Where are we at? Chapter 3 of Matthew. This is the first, this is an introduction to what's about to happen. And nobody reads. They just go, oh, that's nice, that's nice, and keep reading. Every part of the Bible has a reason why it's written. Where it's written, where, when it's written, to whom it's written. And if you don't understand the sequence of what this is doing, this is introduced as like a table of contents, but put in a very prosaic um, way that's poetic, but it's still a table of contents. Everything it lists is going to happen. So the Bible is not like everybody thinks. It's not just a book of stories. Each letter in here in the Hebrew has a number. And all the numbers are consistent through the whole Bible. And it makes a spiral. It goes a spiral out, goes in, and then comes back out again. Same number. If you add each one of the letters up as numbers, it always calculates the same way on every page, on every paragraph, every sentence, and the whole book as a whole. That's, people say, oh, how do you know the Bible wasn't written by man? Okay, Bozo, you try and write a book in which it's mathematically perfect. Go ahead, try it. Dan, Shakespeare, and I love Shakespeare, right? And tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, <laughs> creeps in this, creeps, how does it go? Creep, <laughs> creeps in this petty pace from day to day and to the last 
syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays lead fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life is like a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and is heard no more. All right. Shakespeare. Macbeth. OK, that's Macbeth. Anyway, so understanding that the Bible and the language that Shakespeare's written in is the same language the Bible's written in, 16th century Elizabethan English. So when you read the Bible and you get used to it, then you read Shakespeare and go, well, that's not so bad. <laughs> makes perfect sense to me. So you can, now you go and read the Constitution, it makes total sense. You can read it. All right. And all the great literature, you, you find out it's a piece of cake. You're like, why was it so hard for me? Well, because you, you weren't used to Elizabethan English. Does that make sense? So I've become a real fan. I'm, I'm really enjoying Shakespeare now. I did before, too. But anyway. <laughs> so thinking not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to rise up children unto Abraham. So what God's looking for is someone who will be just have the same heart and soul and mind as who? Abraham. All right. You guys are so sharp. All right, and now also the axe, not ass, it's axe, oh. right? Now the axe, axe, now the axe is laid onto the root of the what? Trees. What are trees? Are they real trees? They're pebbles, right? Pebbles. All right, so trees is a metaphor for people. Therefore, every people, person, which bringeth not forth good. What's good? God's word coming to pass. It's hewn down and cast into the what? How many fires are there? How many? Seven fires. You have seven stages of conflict in which you will hit hard. And the more you know about it, the less... I mean, if you're going to fall down, you're going to roll or you're going to... Guard yourself. If you ever take martial arts, the first thing they do is they teach you, they pick you up and throw you around the room, you know, to get used to falling. They hit you and they kick you. Like, I didn't pay for this. <laughs> but no, that's what you do in martial arts. You have to first learn how to take a punch, how to take a kick, and how to get thrown and how to roll so you don't get too damaged. The Bible informs us what to watch out for. That's why there are seven church what? And there are seven things you have to go through. Got it? So the same situation we have, that's why there's Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Thessalonians. The seven stages. Seven points where you will what? Fall. That's why the Bible says the righteous man falleth what? Seven times and rises eighth. We all have to face those hurdles. How many went through went through childhood? Nobody. You still you still what got your diapers on? Okay, good. All right. So you went through you went through elementary you went through elementary school, right? Okay. You made it through toddler. You made it through childhood. Was it rough? Yeah, it was. Did you make it into being six years old, where your mom took you and dropped you off and said goodbye, and she drove away? And left you all alone. First trauma. First major trauma. And everybody screams and cries. But that's the first trauma. So you said, my mom doesn't love me anymore. She just let me go. And, and children get, this, they traumatize them. That mom would just drop me off and she doesn't love me anymore. So, but everybody goes through traumas. And that's how, how many had a easy, easy uh, teenage years? Do you know what it was like? It's going through teenager. Was it a piece, piece of cake? No, it wasn't. It was hell. How many got in the, the biggest fights of their life when you were a teenager? Right? How many got in the biggest trouble? <laughs> how many got in car accidents? Everything you can go wrong goes wrong when you're a teenager. How do I know this? <laughs> I did it too. Did I have the problem when I was six? I had challenges. Did I have it when I was nine? Yes. Did I have it when I was 12? Yeah. Did I have it when I was 15? 
Did it ever stop? No, I'm still going through these changes. But understand, for the greatest growth and development takes the greatest mental and emotional traumas. That's where you grow. How many have gone through great emotional traumas? Where you have a real wake-up call, like what you thought was right was totally wrong. And when you do, if you make it through it, which most people can and do, then you have a greater perception of what? Reality. Okay. Got it? That's why the fire is there. That's why the Word of God talks about if you have the truth and you build on it lies and deception, which is called wood, hay, and stubble, then when the fire comes, it will burn it all what? Away. There are two usages of words. One is raw, and the other one is pyro. In the Old Testament, it's raw, which symbolizes the the lion. You don't want to do. You don't want to go outside your city because there are like big pussy cats there. They will eat you up. <laughs> and you don't want to. And you don't. When you get into the New Testament, it's a little different because everybody lives in cities. And that. And everybody has candles and oil lamps and everything catches fire. So everybody's afraid of what? Fire. So if you're not be sharp, you're going to get burnt. So you got the two. So you got pyro in the New Testament and you've got Ra in the Old Testament. So you're going to see that, that each one's talked about throughout the Bible. So I'm going to be sharing a lot of these with you so it makes it total makes sense, okay? So the trees is talking about people. There are every tree, every person which bringeth forth not good, but it's good. Fulfilling the word of God, right? In Genesis. And God saw all he did, and it, behold, it was very what? Good, right. So good is referring to its first usage, which means brings to pass what God had in his mind, and it was exactly what he had. And then it's good. He says, I indeed baptize you with what? Water. Wow. John baptized with what? Water. Unto repentance. But he that cometh, what? After me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. And that should be sandals. Nobody wore shoes. And he shall baptize you with what? Holy Ghost. That's Panumahagion, Holy Spirit. And with what? There's fire again. How many here got baptized with fire? I'm okay right now. I want to get baptized. Everybody, want, I want to get baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay, well, and that guess what also comes with it? Fire. It's not one or the other. It's both. Because if you conform to the, you can't have two masters. And if you're trying to walk the word, you're going to get burnt. If you don't stay, if you don't do the word. How do I know this? I've been burnt. You want to see my scars? No, I'm just joking. Okay, I don't have any scars. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Not physical. Anyway. Is that all making sense to you now? Right? So when you ever you get with this, the Holy Spirit, the word Holy Ghost is the same word as Holy Spirit, and there's no such thing as capitals. It's just Holy Spirit, Panumahagion. It's all small in the Greek. They capitalize it in the Bible, and they merge them together. They call it a ghost. They call it spirit. They call it wind. They call it all kinds of stuff. But anyway, <sighs> baptize you with the Holy Panuma Hagion, and what? Fire. So it's fiery, purifying, like silver, purified in the fire, what? Seven times. Again, that word seven is used, seven times being purified. Seven layers of growth, seven church epistles. Got it? Is that making sense? Everybody still with me? Yes. Are you still with me? Okay, good. So God is able to make raise up the, the up children unto Abraham. From what? Stones. Why is that so important? That sounds really corny, doesn't it? I don't need you as a girlfriend. If I want to, I can raise these rocks up to my girlfriend. Not, what? What? You understand? It like, sounds kind of dumb. You won't want to be my friend, then this rock will be my friend. What? Right. It doesn't make any sense. So, what are we talking about here? With God, he, what we would consider irrelevant, what, what John the Baptist is going, he's being a little bit elaborate on this, but he says that which you would never expect of God, God can bring it and make it godly. Got that?
Yeah, because look at me. I made it. Right? <laughs> so God is able to make these stones to rise up children unto Abraham. Now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the what? So baptizing with Holy Spirit and with fire, and if they don't do the word, they get the fire. Just like in the Old Testament, you get the what? The Ra, right? Which is the lion. Yeah. I mean, you, you like getting burnt, or you like you know messing with a big cat. I've always wondered about people. I only want a lion safari. I don't know. Every time I see pictures, of, if I get close to a lion, it looks at me like a lamb chop, you know? Like, now, if there's nothing between me and him, I imagine I probably would be a lamb chop, right? But, mm, pork chop, pork chop. <laughs> lamb chop. <laughs> All right. So, you see, Jesus baptized with what? Holy Spirit. What Jesus came to bring was Holy Spirit. What John came to bring was water, which has a metaphoric value. Remember, the sower soweth the what? And everything there mentions except one thing, water. And if the, if the seed is the thoughts of God, is God's word, then what is the water? The waters is the images, perspective, understanding of God. That's what, that's what John the Baptist brought. But anyway, it's a little advanced. I, want, I don't want to go over everybody's head. I'm not an airplane. All right, sorry. <laughs> you all put up with me pretty cool. I think you're great. So that's John the Baptist in the wilderness saying this, opening up the New Testament. I thought that was pretty cool. So let's review some things here. Now, what do... What, what do, what do, all right? What do, all right. I'm going to show you that. You, how many here know the account of the Syrophoenician uh, woman, Syrophoenician woman, where Jesus, she comes to Jesus and says, heal my daughter? Remember that? How many here remember that? How many don't know what I'm talking about? Okay. All right. Now, this woman comes to Jesus and she says, oh, uh, son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil, and he, Jesus ignores her. He just keeps on walking with his disciples. And she's clawing, oh, please help me, my daughter, my daughter is dying. And he's like, ignores her. And he answered her, not a word. And his disciples came beside him saying, send her away. She's crying after us. Will you get, I can't, we can't handle it anymore. But he answered and said, and he tells her directly, this is Jesus. I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Um, what does that mean? Who is his teachings directly for? The Jews, right? Not the Jews, the Jews. He's right. only for the Jews. Are you Jewish? No, okay. She went, mm -hmm, I really? So, so the question is, He's only for the lost sheep of the house of what? Israel, Jewish. Then came she worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It's not me. It's not right to take the children's bread and cast it to what? Now, how many here would put up with that if Jesus told you that? Well, it's not the Jesus I know. You don't know the right Jesus then. That's the way he is. Because if I could only be near Jesus, he, you'd never get close to him. Why? What are we? Gentiles. And if we think we're all so special, then we're about to be disappointed. Because there is no difference between a slave and a child. Both are under tutors and what? Governors. Which is doctrine and reproof which is the seven church epistles, and to the time appointed of the Father. That's in Galatians chapter 3. And Yan said, it's not right to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, truth! Truth? She's admitting she's a dog? How many people would have said, how dare you call me that? 
I'm never going to come near you again. I'm going to say nothing but bad things about you. But in Spanish. Yeah, in Spanish. But you understand the problem. That's what people would have done. How dare you? Right? But what Jesus is saying is what the Word says. But you might offend somebody. Jesus was really blunt about this. I cannot help you. You are outside of my realm of responsibility, which is the house of Israel, and you are not Jewish. Bye-bye. That's pretty intense. How many would like to give Jesus some correction on how to be polite? I wouldn't advise it. I wouldn't advise it. And she said, truth, you are, let the, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. What did she just admit she was? A dog. She admitted what the word said she was. And that takes a lot. So, but whatever crumbs we can have, I'll accept. Whatever little bit of time you can give me, I'll accept. And Jesus answers, O oh, woman, great is thy what? Pistis. Now, there's your definition of pistis. She's in a point in her life where it's what the Word says that's more important than her own ego or anyone else's feelings or thoughts. And she accepts what the Word says. Well, what happens when you accept what the Word says? Then you get the benefits of what the Word says you'll get by accepting it. And she did. Just ends in the woman, how great is thy pistis. The word faith is ridiculous. There's no place in the Bible except the, in the Old Testament, the only place that's faithful, it talks about faith, is, is talking about faithfulness, not moving, staying committed, focused. That's all that means. That's in Habakkuk. That's the only place it's written anywhere in the Bible. So there's no faith in the Old Testament. Be, all it means is steadfast, unmovable. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. How come now he says this? That now your child can be healed. Why is he saying that now? What did she just prove? The word is truth concerning me, concerning you, and concerning everything. And I do not deny it. I was like, wow. And therefore, the desires of her heart will come to pass. There's no other way to get God to do anything unless you do what his word says. Not intense, but understand, well, if I could live back in a Jesus time, I'd be with his side. You wouldn't get near him. You think you'd spend, he'd spend time with you? The answer is N-O. You know what that spells? Okay. That's cake. K is queso. <laughs> Cheese. Okay. I'm not sent for the lost sheep of the house of what? Israel. But that doesn't mean that. Yeah, he does. Well, he's lying. No, he's not. She's a Gentile. She's got trinity of commitment about the word. And Jesus, short time, and then on, on he goes. See the problem? So Jesus, everybody has in their head the, their cells, brain cells, is not what the Bible's talking about. When I tell people about this, they go, no, Jesus didn't do that. Uh, okay, explain that to me. Well, he really didn't mean it. Yeah, he did. Sure did. You understand the problem? Nobody really knows anything about the Bible. And if they read it, they project into it rather than letting it speak for itself. Does that mean Jesus is a jerk? No. He's the one in charge. How many, ever, how many have more than one brother or sister and grew up? All right. And were you, did they think you were a jerk sometimes? No? You never were? You never were? My brother and sisters always thought I was a jerk because I was in charge. And if you're in charge, you're a jerk. Bottom line. If you're in charge, you're a jerk. And you tell them what not to do and what to do, and they go, huh, I'm not going to listen to you. <laughs> it's not easy being me <laughs> or green or anything else. All right. 
So you understand when you're in charge. So Jesus has to be strict. And it's not like he, he, he wants to be mean or cruel. It's just the word comes what? First. Like, by the way, y'all are more important to me than my own family. You know that. I'd rather spend time with you than my own brothers and sisters. And are they mad at me? There's no comparison. They love the tax man more than me. That's how bad it is. <laughs> and nobody likes a tax man. Okay. So it's not right to take the children's bread, which is Israel, and to give it to dogs. So if you ask Jesus, if, if Jesus knows we're not Jewish, then what are we? Give me a wolf. Wolf, right. I'm just a chihuahua. No. I'm, those guys can be real vicious, man. Non-Judeans, we, it's supposed to be an R and an E there, were. Non-Judeans were the same as what? Dogs. We? Oh, that's still we, yeah. We the perros, right? When did things change? When did things change? When did the disciples become sons of God? Pentecost, that's right. Then they and Jesus came under the blood covenant and they both received the same spirit that Jesus did. Got it? Jesus had received it. He'd earned the spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, the spirit that was in him was now in them. Got it? Did it make it to the Gentiles? No, it did not. But it did make it to the disciples. And Jesus was a Jew, and his disciples were what? Jewish. Jewish. What about Peter? Okay, I'll say their names. You tell me if they're Jewish or not. Andrew. James. John. <laughs> Got a hint? All, they're all Jewish. <laughs> Every last one. So we're going to watch the day of Pentecost when all the disciples became one with Jesus. And that was when the spirit that was in Jesus came upon them. Jesus has already died, rose from the dead, ate and drank with them for 40 days. Oh, wait, you know how long 40 days is? Yes, that's right. Let's all count together to 40, right? I mean, it's 40 days. 40 days, ready? These are days, ready? Go. Days! 22, That's how many days he ate and drank meals with his apostles and disciples after he rose. Do you understand? He was with them that many days, not seconds like we just counted off, but full days, 24-hour periods. You see a problem here. Nobody teaches that. They got up, had breakfast together. Later on, they had lunch together. They had dinner together. They watched him eat. He says, excuse me, well, I have to go abroad. That's their terminology, going to the restroom. When you see it says they went abroad, that's what it's talking about. That's what it means in the Bible. And they went abroad <laughs> to cover their feet. That's what that means, going to the bathroom. <laughs> All right. So that's 40 days he was there. And then he says, okay, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. Don't leave Jerusalem. Stay at the temple and practice. Because John truly baptized with water, but ye truly baptized with the Holy Spirit. So that's the second time it's used. And you'll see that at the end of the Gospels. All right, so I'm going to take you now to where they are. I just compact, compacted it for you there. And when the day of Pentecost was finally come, this was a big day, Jesus already ascended, and he tells them, wait 40 days more till the day of Pentecost. And here it is. 
This is the day they're going to receive the Spirit. The same thing that Jesus got, they got. The same authority and power they're going to get. Or would you be excited? Would you be excited? I, I, I'd be... Uh, <laughs> and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as a fire. Wasn't fire, as a fire. Now, if you look at a, a flame, it, it looks like it has these little, little things that, you know, what do you call those? Like fingers, right? Uh huh. But, but the, what they call this tongue, tongues of flame. Now, what it is, that during the time of Moses, they had a pillar of what? At night. And that was the flames going up. This time it's the flames going down. And each one of the flames, the, the tongues of flames, pointed to each one of the 12 apostles. When they first built the temple, temple, they made it an altar, and the fire came down and consumed the sacrifice, therefore sanctifying the altar. But God now just gave a forwarding address, saying, I'm no longer here. Where'd he go? Where'd he go? He's pointing to where he's going. Remember, the fire always opens up the presence of God. In Genesis, with Abel and Cain, with um, Elijah, Elijah, David, Solomon, always God points and tells people where he's at. By fire. Every time. Yeah. That's why he was with Abel and not Cain. Cain was upset about it. Remember that? You're not that old yet. All right, give me some time. You missed it. <laughs> but understand, this is where it gets so intense. Is that all of a sudden, you've got 40,000 people there. And all of a sudden, the disciples are all sitting there. And they're all excited. They're oh, breathing waiting, because it's going to happen. And all of a sudden, a flame appears from the sky and comes down and stops right above them and then points to each one of the 12. And you open your eyes like, oh my God, close my eyes again. <laughs> oh, would that be exciting? Yeah. Can you imagine everybody else looking at like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> that flame is like right at point, the whole flame is pointing to each one of you guys. So they're all flipped out. Then what happened? Then what happened? <laughs> laser, laser, okay. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. There it is, Holy Ghost, just Holy Spirit, Panumahagion. Began to speak with other what? Tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So what did they do? They spoke in tongues. You can't do that unless you got the Spirit. Ta-da! In other words, they know they what? It kind of like help, but there's a sign going, you know, little fingers of flame pointing to each one of them. Oh my God. <laughs> me too, right? And then they just start speaking in tongues. And that's why they, this is what Jesus, everything that Jesus said they would do. And these signs shall follow them that what? Believe. And then they spoke in tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. So it didn't come from their brain cells, it came from the what? The spirit. The spirit gives the utterance. You still have to move your lips, your throat, your tongue. You still have to make the sounds, but you're all as it's directing you. Got it? Not real difficult. Ah, oh, and there were dwellers in Jerusalem with Jews. Devout men are of every nation under heaven. Well, under heaven means within that region. <laughs> it doesn't mean like Africa and Australia. No, I mean right there. The heaven where God's will is at. That's why it's under heaven, under the authority of God. So when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, because there's about 8,000 people there, and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own tongue? Now, this is interesting because the word for tongue and the word for language and the word for culture and the word for inspiration are all the same word, which is kind of confusing because are they speaking in tongues 
or that they personally have, or is it talking about their language that they communicate with? The reason I know this is because every place that it's mentioned here, the Romans had noticed that these people from these areas all do what's called glossalia. Glossalia. I know that sounds weird. Glossalia is Greek for speaking in tongues. All these places that they're mentioning here, what the Romans and Greeks had recorded years before, that when they went into worshiping God, they would do this utterance that wasn't a language that the Greeks or the Romans knew. And it's called glossolalia, glossolalia, which means uh, the tongue. So of the tongue. So this becomes interesting. Each one of these cities. So let me, look, I'll just continue on. And it listens, how we hear a man's own tongue, wherein we are born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites. Well, the Parthians doing it? Yeah, they recorded them speaking in tongues. The Medes, yep. Elamites, no record of that, that they're in the same area. Mesopotamia, yep. They, they were practices of Glasalia hundreds of years before. And in Judea, Cappadocia, yep, they were practiced uh, Glasalia. Pontus and in Asia, yep. Phrygia, Pamphylia, yep. In Egypt, yep. Libya and Cyrene. Um, Libya, maybe, I don't, I don't know where I can Cyrene. Strangers in Rome. This is what was called the um, Mithrans. They spoke in tongues. This is before the day of Pentecost. These, all these people were there, and they heard the Jews speak in tongues, just like they did when they worshipped. Now, all the people that were righteous are now put to what? Together. Both Jew and what? Gentile. Is this important? Yeah, it's pretty important. Strangers in Rome, Jews and what? Proselytes. Cretes and Arabians, we'd hear them speak in tongues the wonderful works of God. Can you do it without the Spirit? Nope. Got to have the Spirit. All right. Cretes and Arabians, do we hear them speak in tongues the wonderful works of God? So when someone speaks in tongues, they are speaking the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were all in doubt saying to one another, what meaneth this? And if you read that account, it's talking about the end times, which we're now approaching. That's that one, that uh, 3,000 anniversary, completing it. All right, so here it is. Filled with speaking tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So let me show you the places where they all come from. Rome, proselytes, that's where the um, Mithrans are. Asia, Pamphylia, Pamphylia is right here. This is called Asia right here, this district. Pamphylia, this is uh, Cappadocia is right here. Pontus is right here. These were also known to do what? Glasalia. Glasalia, uh-huh. Mesopotamia, Parthia, Media. Remember I was telling you about Medians that what was Moses' father-in-law? Median. Remember when, yeah. when, when Jethro showed up, he's a median, and all of Israel came out and bowed down to him? Remember that? You are old. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, remember the account, right? Not, you remember it. And of course, being in Judea, they were speaking in tongues. So now Judea now joins the group of those who recorded as operating with Glossalia. Glossalia, oh, there it is in the Greek, Translated as speaking in tongues, the phenomenon of speaking in an unknown language, especially in religious worship, ecstatic, it's also called ecstatic utterances. So this is what we're practicing that. But did they have the spirit? No. They had a, well, let me ask you a question. This is what gets confusing when I talk about spirit. And, you know, let's go into numbers. Grab your Bible. Go into numbers. Because, you know, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God because he doesn't got the Spirit. So you can't see the color yellow unless you've got eyeballs. So in Numbers, there's a really fascinating account. Am I standing in your way? 
Okay, how about now? <laughs> let me know, let me know, let me know. Numbers chapter 11. Right? It's right before chapter 12. Right after chapter 10. Everybody getting, uh, isn't that brilliant? Yeah. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> I'm just trying to help everybody get there. All right. In verse 10, what does it say? And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation that I may stand there with thee, that they may stand there with thee. Now listen carefully. Everybody read it out loud with me. Ready? Verse 17. Go. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the prayer which is upon thee, and will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bearest not thyself. Well, did Moses do that? Yes. Yep. Now, in verse 25 is the actual happening of it. So the Spirit, every time, every man of God in the Bible and woman of God had the Spirit of God. The same thing that Jesus had? No, but they did have the Spirit, which is basically the most they get was what, what Adam had. So the same Spirit that had was upon Adam you can attain up to that point, but no further. Well, now we have the spirit that's within Christ. But does that mean there's nobody with spirit that, unless they're Christians? No, that's not true. Here, Moses has the spirit. He's not Christian. Because it's not the fullness of it. Remember, because God made Adam and Eve. Not Steve, Eve. And God put his spirit, what? Upon them. <laughs> Everybody here with a Bible? <laughs> okay. Yes. But do you understand? This situation boils down to God first made them body, then gave them what? Soul, and then gave them what? Spirit. And later on, they lost the what? Spirit. They still lived on, but then they died. All right. So here we have an account of Moses getting the what? Spirit. That's pretty hot, right? And all this time, God's been talking to him and him talking to God because he's got what? Like, I can't call you up on my cell phone unless you got a what? That's right. <laughs> I know your number. Anyway. <laughs> but I, have you ever watched these people walking around there? They got that little earbud in their ear, and they're talking away. And you go like, who in the hell are they talking to? And they're arguing with them and stuff. And like, So what do they got? Well, number one, they got a cell phone. Number two, they got an earbud. Yeah. So, a person who has the Spirit of God, can God talk to them? Yes. What if they don't got their earbud in, spiritually speaking? They're not listening. Then God, they're not going to hear them. Got it? How many here can, how many here got the Spirit of God? That's right. Me too. Hey, hey. All right. So, I can hear from God. I'm pretty blessed when I am. I'm really, I'm really concerned when I'm not. <laughs> All right. But is it the same as Moses? No, a lot different. If you make one mistake with Moses, you lose everything. If I make a mistake, Christ covered for me. That doesn't mean I can go run and, you know, do dumb stuff. Or semi-smart. <laughs> All right. So did Moses have the spirit? Yes, that's why God could tell him what to write when he wrote the commandments. That's why he received revelation. And then after those 70 got it, they go, we got the spirit. Na, 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 na. Well, they blew it. They didn't keep the ear, they didn't put the even the earbuds in. They walk around and say, I got a cell phone, but they wouldn't talk to God, and God wasn't going to talk to them. And they decided they were going to kill Moses. <laughs> Obviously, that wasn't revelation. But anyway, I hate it when that happens. So did Moses have spirit? Yes. It's the same spirit you've got. No. Well, if it was the same spirit, you made one mistake, you'd lose it. 
because it's Jesus and he hasn't lost it yet. So if he still got it, then guess what? We still got it. So we can do some really dumb, stupid stuff and we still, all we got to do is turn back and we get it back. We don't lose anything. We don't think, how many have made dumb, stupid mistakes? Okay. Does that making sense? So did, was speaking in tongues done? Yes. With the spirit we've got now? No. It was with the spirit, the best that was available at that time. That's the equivalent of Moses. That's why you look at, well, who is Balaam? Balaam was the man of God before Moses. Well, who is Melchizedek? He had the spirit too. Was he Jewish? No, he was Melchizedek. Well, Melchizedek, right? How did he get the spirit? So God's responsible for those who have the right what? Heart. God doesn't look at anything else. You're Mexican. You don't get anything. But no, wait, what? <laughs> you got blue eyes. You're, you're full of, you know, whatever. You're a pint low, you know. But you understand, this is where they came. This is where they all practiced Glossalia. In fact, there's many occurrences in the Hebrew Old Testament where they called it speech of angels. And that's what that is. That's Glossalia, with the spirit of Moses. Not of Jesus. We got more. Okay. All right. So now, let me introduce you to a man by the name of Julius Caesar, right? This is very important to understand a little bit what, what's going on and who Cornelius is. Now, when in, in, 58, in, in 58 BC, there was a man by Julius Caesar who was a, uh, in charge of the northern regions of Italy. He was a, a proletariat. He was an uh, overseer, like a governor almost, but a military governor for the northern regions of Italy. But he got a wild hair and decided, you know what? See all those lands north of us? No one's conquered them yet. I'm going to conquer them. And he did. And he went out there and conquered all of what is called present-day France, Belgium, German, and Switzerland. And captured all those people. These, these, now, you understand, the, Caesar was only like about five foot seven maybe five foot six. And these German guys are all like six foot. <laughs> these are big guys. And Caesar, with his army, was able to subdue them. Now what happened, by the time we get to 50 BC, <coughs> is that he, he had, gave them all a choice. I either kill you, or you can be a part of my army. And then wherever plunder we get, you get some of it. I go, okay, that sounds like a good deal. <laughs> so he incorporated all the tribesmen into his army that he, when he went and defeated the Germans and the Swiss and the Belgians and the French, when he defeated them, he incorporated them into his army. He got so many that he exceeded the armies of Rome that was protecting the city. And so I was coming back across, there was this thing called the Rubicon River. Because I crossed this river with my men. That's against the law. If I cross it and go into Rome and defeat the, the army there, overrun them, then I can be wherever I want to be, including emperor. And he did it. He just like, <laughs> fell right through it. It's like someone like, Biden decides to conquer the United States, you know, sets it up and says, from now on, the emperor disbands the Senate and whatever. So, with the German army that he assembled, German tribesmen, now his army, he was training them. He did it for like four years, five years. Then proceeded to Rome, where he overcame the city, defenses, and in a military coup, declared himself what? Emperor. That's the first emperor of Rome. A military overtaken. All Gaelic soldiers, that's those who were in Gaul, would be granted citizenship, Roman citizenship, after 25 years of military what? Right now, they, they had no rights, but they served in the military for 25 years, and they'd be full-fledged citizens. citizens. Sound familiar? <laughs> United States he does the same thing. Later, under the authority of Octavian, 
Caesar Augustus, that's after, after Caesar died, Caesar Augustus, the grant, he granted the citizenship by military service was given to the eastern provinces. That is, guess where? Guess where that's at? All this area. Before it was all this area. After Caesar died and Octavian took his place, Augustus, then he granted it for everyone in here. So guess what everybody wanted to do? Join the military service. And they did. And that's where he comes in. Now, when the Germans did it, you had several years where the Germans were sent to the baddest parts of battle. They were always sent to the very front lines. That's what you did to people going for citizenship. You put them in the raw, worst places. And these big Germans, like, no problem, dude. <laughs> but <laughs> no, I'll move that tree for you, you know, that kind of thing. But, none, <laughs> but nonetheless, this was added to it. So what happened was they brought the Germans, and they gave them, because of all these, the problems they were having with the, the Judeans and the and Jews, they sent these German tribesmen to help keep the peace in the East. Very, very bad idea. They did things that are so bad. Yeah. They needed to take a dump. There was the temple. They just dumped. They did, they did sacrilege after sacrilege, and they just killed people for the heck of it. They were just savages. So as a result, the Jews revolted massively, and all Palestine revolted. And Rome went like, whoa, how'd this happen? German soldiers, get them out of there. They were the Gauls. So they said, okay, you guys will stay on this side, and we'll let all the people over here enter in, and they will take care of the Roman requirements on this side. So all the Germans wound up over here, and all the Eastern, that's when the beginning of the split of the Roman what? Empire. Is this all making sense? And eventually, this all collapses, and all there is is Constantine, Constantinople. Does that make sense? Because this eventually falls, because the, the, the tribesmen of Europe are not really nice guys. <laughs> Even got worse in the Crusades, but we don't go there. Okay, so this is what the places were called back in the first century. These were all provinces of Rome. But all these guys here, which happens to be the same ones that are listed here, which practice what? Glossalia were also incorporated into the Marina, and they took care of this area. And the Germans took care of the other side. Okay. It was the service members that oversaw the operation and the ministry of Roman authority in Palestine, or those from Anatolia, where I showed you that whole stretch of area down to Mesopotamia. That's where he comes from. So let's learn about Cornelius. When you think of corn, what do you think of? Like a corn tortilla. <laughs> <¿Qué tal? laughs> no, it's not corn like in corn tortilla. Right? It's corn. It's Cornelius, not corn tortilla. All right. All right. So. There's a certain man in Caesarea named Cornelius. Now, first of all, let's figure out what Cornelius means. You know, we already know what a centurion is. We know what a Roman soldier is. But when we say Cornelius, what are we talking about? Well, this word, nobody is born with that word, that name. That's a, that's a name that's given to you when you've proven yourself. David became the horn of Israel. Got it? Jesus is the horn of God. You, you understand now? Gentiles. Yeah. So the Gentiles are from that culture as the Bible, or haven't you noticed? All right. So Cornelius is called Cornelius, right? And it means, there's the Hebrew word right there, which is Karen. You know any Karens? Okay. No, I don't know. Karen. It's the Hebrew word for Cornelio. 
which means horn. That's how you spell kalen in Hebrew. It's not with a K, it's with a Q. All right, it just means horn. So when you see a bull, like for instance, in, when you read, read Deuteronomy, it talks about if the, if the uh, ox, if, if the horn, and it's referring to the ox, but it only says one horn, it doesn't make any difference because you're not looking at the ox, you're looking at its power the, to damage or to hurt. So you refer to it as a horn. You don't say the horns because that's not, it has one strength and ability to defend itself, and that's with its horn. So you don't say horns. So that's why the unicorn just means, that's where the problem with us doing translations for unicorn doesn't mean unicorn. It just means one of strong force, like, like, like a horn, which could be two horns. When you look at Taurus, Taurus in astrology, which goes back to time of Adam, that Taurus has only one what? Horn. That means it's might and strength and focus. So what we're looking at is the characteristics, right? I know, like in Spanish, you go, hey, como esta, gordo? All right, so we're looking at the characteristics of the person, that you're complimenting them on their abundance, right? All right. <laughs> you ever see Alexander the Great, the pictures of him? He's got horns. Seriously, they, they got, he's got horns. Like, what? He didn't have any horns. Well, you, you, you put them on his head anyway because he's Alexander the Great. He's a cabron, right? He's a male goat. That's what a male goat is. Now, if a man acts like a male goat, then you call him that name. And, of course, that's derogatory because he doesn't have anything else but that. Anyway, you call it you call macho menos, right? Anyway. Characteristics of the individual living come his name upon receiving what? Citizenship. These are not the things that he wants people to look at. I want people to call me gorgeous. No, no it doesn't look like that. <laughs> they call you by your characteristics, right? Or you can do it just the opposite and call them, you know, like calling someone who's short, calling them giant or something, you know. But that seldom happened. They just found the characteristics of the person and they gave them that name. That's why Octavian's called Augustus. Was he brilliant and beautiful? No, he was a jerk. But nonetheless, that was his name, was Augustus. So every time you got accomplishments in the Roman society, you added to your name. So when he became a Roman citizen, he got his name of Cornelius, which means what? Horn. Now, as an auxiliary, because he's not a Roman citizen at the time, when he was younger, they forced him to the center and attack the enemy first. So he was always the first one to engage the enemy. Right? <laughs> Do you understand? He was the first one. So if you go, I get to be a man. If I can just survive the next 25 years, it's like, <laughs> all right, I'll make it to citizenship. He did. But the, the thing is, if you look at what the daily hours and work that a, a centur any kind of Roman soldier put in, it's like, how did anyone survive five years? But he did, and he is an expert. In it. Now, I'm going to explain to you the standard here. The question is, for him to be called by his Latin term, which coincides to the Koine and the Hebrew, the Latin, he was called Cornelius. So what did they, the Romans had to sit there and say, he is a, a horn. He is a source of strength. He is focused. He is everything you think of, like a horn, ah, like, like a bull. You know, I don't know, what a toro, right? Bull. Way or something. I don't know. <laughs> no way. No, no way. <laughs> no way, okay. No way, <laughs> way. <laughs> Characteristics of the individual that became his name upon receiving citizenship. So let's come in. To what standard was he compared to? That he was extraordinarily received the name Horn. Not only was it accepted and his name for the Latin that gave him that, but all those who knew him on both sides of the culture, East and West, he was extraordinary. What was the standard? Because Rome, they don't care about the Bible. 
I'm talking about Cornelius. This guy is exceptional. So let's look at, okay, mas maiorum. That's what it was. That's the standard for all, the standard for the Roman citizen, soldier, and, and uh, patriot, uh, patrician was mas maiorum. Right, which basically is the way of the ancestors. And that's, that is, where are they? Well, I'm going to show you them. You'd like to see them? Yes. Here we go. Fides. That's Latin, obviously. Encompasses several English words. There's no real direct translation, but it basically means trust and trustworthiness. He has to be good, faithful, and faithfulness. He has to have confidence, reliability, and credibility. That's what this means. That's what he had to develop. That's what he grew in as a Roman soldier. That's intense. You don't get born with that stuff. You have to develop. Yeah. Then we have pietas, which was the Roman attitude of dutiful respect toward the gods. Homeland, parents and family, which requires the maintenance of relationships in a moral and dutiful manner. That means your commitment to everybody. You never lie, you never cheat, you never steal. You always fulfill your promises and you do your utmost for others. Next Roman soldier, you notice that this became the standard of what we call knighthood. Because the former Roman the former Roman centurions are those that were in part of the uh, cohort on England. When England fell, these men stayed behind and they became known as Arturas was his name. And he was the leading uh, proprietor. And when it fell away, we hear about king, rather than Praetor, but they call him King Arthur. And it's uh, Praetor Arturas became King Arthur. So that's how he lived by. Isn't that neat? So what else is there? There is religio and cultus. Cultus. Related to the Latin verb regale, to bind. Religio was the bond between the gods and mortals, as carried out in the traditional religious practices for the preserving of Pax Decorum, the peace of the gods. Cultus was the act, observance, and the correct performance of rituals. Religious practices, in this sense, is to be distinguished from piatas and its inherent morality. So this is the religious side. This is what he had to be very religious. So he surpassed that. He's a horn in every one of these. He is, repeat after me, he's a horn. He doesn't bend. He doesn't break. He's there like a horn. So they found his concept of God so extraordinarily superior. They found his practice of things for God so utmostly perfect. He never did any ceremonies, didn't need to. Just the way his statement is, how he dressed himself, how he spoke. He always fulfilled everything he said. He kept every promise. He's an extraordinary man. But he was the horn, and the horn don't break. Disciplina. The military character of the Roman society suggests the importance of disciplina. You know what that is? Discipline. All right. Spank him. All right. As related to education, it's not just punishment. It's referring to the discipline of education. Wow. How many of you ever went to college? And if you took like nine or ten courses, it takes a lot of what? Discipline. All right. So it's not just discipline physical. It's also education, training, discipline, and self-control. And in that area, he was a what? A horn. 
gravitas and cantantia. Gravitas was the dignified self-control. Again, back to self-control. Constantia was a steadiness or perseverance, never quitting. He was the most highly decorated of all. Extraordinary man. In the face of adversity, a good Roman soldier was to display an unperturbed face. No matter if they're coming at you, you had to stay perfectly what? Calm. Never losing your emotion, never giving over to emotions. Never, if you turn around and ran scared, your men with you would kill you. Did you know that? Because if you let the Roman soldier who decides to run against the enemy and, it, and his men let him do it, then the word decimate is where that comes from. They would take, if there was 100 men, 10 men were put to death arbitrarily for that one man's cowardice. They just arbitrarily took 10 men, killed them. Anyone else do that again? Another 10 men are going to die. That's how rough it was being in the Roman military. I'm glad the United States military is not like that. <laughs> Because we had a lot of cowards. But in the face of adversity, you have to stay perfectly what? Calm. Self-controlled. No emotional response. How many ever had a really bad situation and got scared? Oh, yeah. You won't make it. All right. So unperturbed. So you can imagine what kind of man this was. He was, he was, a, he was a horn in every one of these statements. All right, and then the other one is virtus, derived from the Latin word ver, which man. Virtus constitutes the idea of a true Roman, male. These are the qualities, valor, masculinity, excellence, courage, character, and worth. He had to be, where just spending a few minutes, you knew he fit all those categories. The last thing, if you have all of those, then you have this. Dignitatis and actus. Actoritas. Dignitatis and actoritas were the result of displaying when you, people said there's no doubt that you have these, the values of the ideal Roman and the service of the state in the forms of priesthood or religious responsibilities, military positions, magistrates. Dignitas was reported for reputation for worth, honor, and esteem. That's a Roman who displayed their gravitas Constantia, Fides, Pietas, and other values of a Roman would possess dignitatis among their peers. Similarly, by that path, a Roman could earn actoritas, prestige, and respect. And that was obviously when they gave him the name Cornelius. Because he was an example in all those categories. So he wasn't just a combat soldier. He was what we would call a what? A knight. What we qualify today as a knight. When we think of knights, a lot of people are knighted that shouldn't be. All right, Acts 10, 2. Now here's what the word says about him. The word says, God saying, describing him, looking at his heart, he's a devout man, one that, and that's the word, what is this? Not fair. Yadi, right? That's reverence, respect to God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God. What is that word? No. The same way all the time. If there was an S at the end, that would be every single way there is. So it's all way, which means one way all the time. Isn't that cool? That's what God says about him. This guy is not just a normal guy. And he's the first, first Gentile to receive the blood covenant of Jesus. He's the first one. 
Why did God choose him first? You understand? God called him. Yeah. He's extraordinary. In every category, from the Romans' point of view, from God's point of view, he's outstanding. So from both sections, both on the Gentile side and the godly side, he's knocking it out of the park. He's hitting home runs everywhere. So this, he's not just a normal guy. He's, and he's the first one of the Gentiles. He's the prototype, the example, the standard, the first Gentile. So I look at my life and I compare it to his. I'm going, I need some work. <laughs> you understand? But that's, what it, that's the exception of a man he is. He was, I mean, I've seen a lot of officers and a lot of combat men and people, and I always tried to be the best I could be, but there was always someone that was just extraordinary. And if you read the accounts of, of uh, um, Marcus Aurelius, who was the emperor in the second century, he mentions a man by the name of Maximus. And it's absolutely a story. He says it was the one of the finest men he's ever known in his life. He was a Roman centurion. He was from the, the uh, Anatolian region. And he says he never had a bad thing to say about anybody. He never complained. He was always focused and always had good things to say. He always gave absolute maximum. And if you were in his presence, you never felt that he was superior to you. They made everybody feel comfortable at the same level. Extraordinary man. So there was a lot of excellent. The thing about knighthood, this is why I tried to move and bring the knighthood, because I was trying to bring that standard of Cornelius into the world in this day and time. But I'm realizing that um, it's rather difficult because people don't have the same desire. They just want the title rather than um, actually being it. So they, they want to be recognized as an athlete and do absolutely nothing. They'd rather wear the clothes of an athlete or the hat of an athlete, or, but not be the real thing. So uh, that doesn't work very well. But we do have several that are holding that standard, which I'm very proud of, which I'm very thankful that I was able to get them. The thing about being a knight is you don't need anyone's recognition. But what does need help is what other people see. That they, because a lot of people you're around all the time never recognize what you're doing. They never recognize what you're giving. They never recognize your sacrifices. And they do need to be recognized for the sake of the other people who might open their eyes to see what you're doing. Not so much for the person, because they're going to do it either way. They're going to stand. They're going to be extraordinary. But other people need to recognize it rather than finding fault with them. So anyway, on the Cornelius, one of the men I truly reckon, I always wanted to know so much about him. So I read all I could find on the, the actual centurion, what it took, where he was from. Um, the reason I know he was from, the uh, because of what happened after Julius Caesar brought in the Germans, and the Germans came into as the policemen, as the authorities, as the administrators, they just screwed everything up. And they did the most terrible things and caused more revolts. So they just said, no more. Pushed the Germans on that side of the empire and then let the out, those under Octavian, let all the Anatolian great people rule that area if they wanted to be a Roman citizen. And that's where he comes in. Obviously, he's been there for 25 years. And he's a recognized Roman citizen now, so he's got 30 years of military service at this point. He's already past that point. He's like five years into it. But he is extraordinary. So let's continue on about him. So I showed you what, what, what happens here. So now we're in Acts chapter 10, verse 3 through 6. Now what happened to Cornelius, because of his dedication and commitment, it wasn't like he was trying to please anybody. He just wanted to be right with God. And he saw a vision, evidently, about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming unto him, 
saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? He was expecting to hear from God. How many here are expecting to hear from God? If you expect to hear from God, then you will. God wants to talk to you more than you want to talk to him. Seriously. But you got to think his thoughts. Si te hablo contigo en español, necesito que tu primero pensar en los pensamientos. Es de la lengua. Español, ¿sí o no? Si tú hablas en español y mis pensamientos están en inglés, no puedo que entender ninguna palabra. ¿Verdad? So, same thing with God. You have to be thinking God's thoughts, his perception, his reality to receive from him. God don't speak English. He doesn't go into languages. He deals with visions. He wants to see your heart. That's why, best way to worship him is by spirit so that it's all your heart, soul, and mind to him, and then he sees it all, and then he responds. Really cool. All right. And when he looked on me, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname was Peter. He lodged with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou ought to do. Doesn't that bother you when you read that? Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't that bother you? It bothered me. It bothered me a lot. Because when I go to God, I don't expect him to tell me to go to somewhere else. Notice, he's, he, you can't find a more committed man. He faced dangers, death, combat, and he protected his men. He, he rose up to the ranks, and he's like the best centurion ever. He was always at the front lines. He was fearless, dedicated, committed. And he goes to God, and God says, I'll tell you what, go talk to this person. Didn't that bother you? Why didn't the angel tell him what had to be told? Well, why didn't God tell him himself? Don't you ever ask these questions? Or am I the only one? Why do you think that is? I'm sorry? No, he's ready. I mean, pfft. How many here is dedicated as him? As committed as him? So this becomes a real challenge. What's the deal? Why won't the angel tell him? Why won't God tell him? You know why? That's right. Peter's the one in charge. So now who's in charge? Now that Peter's not here. We are. So if someone wants to know about God, and they pray, and an angel appears. What are you going to say? You're going to send them to you. Now what are you going to do? Who are you going to send them to? You're it. <laughs> Who did God send you to? Him, right? Don't cry. It's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, you see the situation is that people don't realize that God can't talk he, he, we put people in charge. And those who are have the same anointing as Jesus, which is what the word says we got, we're the ones that people have to go through to understand no God. Because without us, they're not going to get the word. Which is like, I'm not really the best example. Well, it doesn't matter. That's, I'm the only one God got right now. Until you guys raise up, then I'll have competition, right? Yeah, maybe with real compost. Okay. So why didn't the angel tell him? He doesn't have the right, nor the privilege, nor the authority. Why didn't God tell him? Because it's already been delegated. Already been delegated. God doesn't do that anyway. He doesn't do that. He did with Moses. Didn't work out so good. So he gives it to Jesus. Jesus gave it to Peter. Now who's got it? Now that Peter's not here. Is Peter here? No. Oh. Is Jesus here? No. Then who the heck is God going to send people to? Us. Us. All right, let's try it again. Who is God going to send people to? Us. All right. You ever notice you keep seeing the same person over and over again for some reason? Your three guesses why. Okay. 
And when the angel of the Lord spoke unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout what? Soldier. Uh-oh, Roman soldier. Now, understand, Peter doesn't have a really good relationship with Roman soldiers. You ever notice that? I mean, <laughs> yeah, him and Roman soldiers don't get along too well. <laughs> I mean, he's had, he's had a situation where he cut off someone's ear and, you know, kind of stuff like that. And what happened? Anyway, so he's not in a good shape here. So what happens is that Cornelius is sending household servants, that's cool, and a devout soldier. That's not going to fit too well with Peter. Peter's going to be a little concerned. So as a result, and wait for him, waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he told them what's going on. He sent them to Joppa. Why to Joppa? That's where Peter's at. That's right. Why, why didn't he send them to Jerusalem? Or no, that's not where supposed to go get Peter, remember? You were listening, right? Okay. On the morrow, as they went up on their journey and drew nigh on to the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray. How many go pray on top of the housetop? No, you don't. No one does that. People will think you're weird. I'm going to go outside and get on top of the roof and pray. Like, what? All right, now I understand the, the houses, if you study archaeology, you'll find that the houses are rather simple. There's, it's kind of like a square box, except there's a hole in the middle of the house. And what happens is the, the roof is pretty flat, but if you, if you were on top of the house and you look down through the hole, you would see where the fireplace is. And that's where all the cooking's done. So what happens is the center room of the house is the actual kitchen. That's where they cook everything. There are small little areas where people go and sleep. And they draw the curtains, or they, yeah, they mostly draw curtains, and that's where they sleep, men and women. But in the center of the house is where all the cooking's done. On the wall, you may have a, um, a lambskin with water in it and whatever, but in the center, what happens in the center? That's where the cooking's done. Now, in about 12, after 2 o'clock, the women start to cook. You light the fire off. You know how hot it is outside? Very hot. So, so in order to get preparing for the dinner, all the men go, okay, ladies, we're going to make our exit. And they go outside. Now, outside, it's been hot all day long, so the ground is really what? Hot. So the only place you can do where to cool off is on top of the what? On top of the house. And that's where you hear the whole, the, then the sea breezes, which normally go from the land to the sea, now come from the sea to the land. The air currents swap. And you watch all the, the, sea reed, the, where the, the sea reeds, they're all laying down. Now they start doing this and start coming up as it cools down. And these are thousands, as far as you can see, just sea, sea reeds just doing this waving as they're getting up to find they'll be straight up again like around 5 o'clock. That's why everybody goes out in the evening to watch the reeds wave in the, in, in the sea breeze as it comes across and it cools and the, as the reed, so it looks like a waving, it's a beautiful sight. Watch a video of it sometime, you know, talk about the, the, the reeds in the Palestine area. You see them at, at sunset, it starts, they, before sunset they start Lifting up, and they do it in waves by the breeze from the ocean. But anyway, that's what Peter's up there because it's nice and what? It's nice and cool, right? So he's up there. What's he doing? You can't miss how beautiful everything is. And you sit on top of there, and that's where you're prosuche, right? Lift your heart, your soul, and your mind to God for his doctrine, reproof, and what? Correction. So that's what he's doing. He's up there doing prosuche because God wants to see your what? He doesn't want to hear how well you know how you memorize the prayer. Our Father, we're in heaven, how be done, can come over, be done, he gives us to daily bread, and we give us on top of the reef, to the reef, and we on top of the reef, and we give Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord, the blessed people. I used to be a really good Roman Catholic. I'd get through my, my prayers faster than anyone else. It means absolutely what to God? Nada. Don't do that stuff. You know, repetitive. Christ tells that. So, what we got here? 
Peter went up to the prosuche. So what do you do? You close your eyes, picture God where? Around you and in you. And then you breathe the air, and it's cool and refreshing. It's, it's lifting everything, the whole day, everything to God. Remember, I do, you're supposed to do that how many times a day? One. At least one hour a day, right? At least. And if you don't do it one hour a day, at least wait for the Sabbath and do the whole day. That's what you're supposed to do. People say, do you recognize the Sabbath? No, freaking every day is a Sabbath for me. Every day is a Sabbath. I put God first every day, not just once a week. I wake up in the morning for God, and I go before I go to sleep, if I go to sleep, if I go to sleep, for God. Proceed. Am I perfect? No, I don't want to be perfect. It's not my job. God's perfect. I'm not. I'm just thankful. All right, so on the morrow, I went on a journey and drew nigh onto the city. Peter went up on the housetop to pray, prosuche. And that's exactly what you do. You don't carry a rosary with you or a statue or any of that crap. Just you and God. And that's when you show God your heart, your soul, and your mind. And he reviews it and then gives you doctrine reproof or what? So here we go. I told you that's what goes on, right? And he became very hungry and would have eaten. Why? Because it's almost dinner time. He could smell the food down in the kitchen, right? The hole's right there. <laughs> you know, it's just like. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they were made ready, that's the women down where they were cooking, he fell into a trance. Now, it's not like a trance, like, oh, I'm a happy medium. No. <laughs> That's like, you know, you, you focus, and everything disappears, and just, you just got God and what he says and what his word says. Now, what's he supposed to do? That's prosuche, right? So what's he going to get? Either doctrine, reproof, or what? So here we go. That is how God shows you when you're in prosuche. And he became, all right, and he saw heaven open. This is a vision, you're going to get visions, and a certain vessel descending onto him, as it had been a great sheet, that's sheet with two E's, sheet knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth. Bless your heart. Did you turn off your cell phone? <laughs> Wherein there were all manners of four-footed beasts and of the, er of the earth, and a wild beast, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice unto him, say, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Remember what John the Baptist said, He can make these stones the children of Abraham. Now watch carefully. At no, hand, at no time will my hand leave my arm. <laughs> and the voice spoke unto him again the second time. So this is the second time. It shows the animals. And spoke unto him again the second time. What God hath cleansed, that call not thou what? Common. This was done how many times? Three times. Now, how many have ever seen the word constraining in the Bible? Constrain. Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a boat. Right? You see that word constrain? <laughs> if you ever go to Asia, you'll notice that people will ask you, they'll do something, they'll go say, well, would you like something to eat? And you go, no, I'm fine. They go, no, I'm going to get you something to eat, okay? And you go, no, I'm okay. And they go, seriously, I'm going to get you something. Three times. That's constraining. So when Jesus constrained his disciple, it means he had to tell him what? Three times. So there's always that option for people to save pace. But God's not giving him. That's it. It's Usually God won't ask you to do something more than twice. Only if he does it a third time and you don't do it, then there's repercussions, consequences. So God will only ask you and me what? Twice. Because if he asks you a third time and you don't do it, then there's consequences. So God would rather not ask you a third time. All right, so. 
So God did this what? Twice. Right, he did that twice. And that called not that will come, and it was unbent. And the vessel was received up again into what? Heaven. This was done three times. He doesn't have a choice. But the question is, what is it talking about? Something that was considered unclean, it is now clean. Got it? Does that make sense? Good, 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 good. Who's on their way to see Peter? Aha! You're paying attention. Told you this class would cost you. Got to pay attention. <laughs> now, while Peter doubted in himself, what the heck was that all about? And we ever had a vision from God and like, how in the heck does this make any sense, right? Well, he's wondering, why would God do that? What? How is this reproof or correction? I don't understand. Because it's not like he was sleeping. He was in, you know, prosuche. I got some of the coolest ones. There was these things where I had a real problem with because I would teach someone the word and they just became worse. <laughs> like, what? So no matter how much I taught them the word, they just got worse and worse and worse and worse. I'm like, ah, oh, so I went to God with it, right? All of a sudden, this beautiful vase in my mind appeared, right? Beautiful crystal vase. And it was filled with this black, gooey mess just filled all over. And then this little drop of water hits it, and it bubbles out, and a little bit of goo comes out. Then a little bit more water and more black goo goes out. Then more water, more water, and more black goo comes out. All this black goo is coming out. Then all of a sudden you can start to see inside the glass. And then all of a sudden that black goo is, is pulling all the stuff what? Out. So it wasn't, the, it wasn't I wasn't failing. <laughs> the guy had so much stuff in there it was coming out. And I was getting, I was getting, I was like, oh, is this guy ever going to get into the word? <laughs> But that's not the case. You understand? And that's what God was showing me. Well, pardon? Yeah. It just comes in and everything else goes out. That's why, you, and you shall cast out devils means you put the word in and the devils go out. You don't have to do anything. So this is why when you are walking by God's direction, you're going to give them the word that will bless their heart, their soul, their mind, heal their heart, their soul, their mind and allow God to protect, guard, and keep them. And that's the greatest thing you can do. Now, that's, but you do this the best when you prosuche and speak in what? Tongues. Because that's your spirit praying. I showed you that. Okay. Well, Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. <laughs> so Peter kind of leans over the top of the house and looks down, and what does he see? Roman soldier. <laughs> How am I getting what sticks doing? <laughs> like, oh boy. Peter doesn't want to see this. This is not a good idea to see a Roman soldier down. Arise, therefore, and get thee down and go with them. Like, Doubting nothing. Roman soldier. <laughs> God says, for I have what? Sent them. Isn't that cool? So Peter's like, you sent a Roman soldier after me? <laughs> Does this make any sense? No. Does it make sense with his, with his vision he got? No. All, he's like, I don't understand. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, uh, I am he. Now, but, now, normally, if God hadn't told him that, he would have hot-footed it out of there. <laughs> Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause wherefore you are come? You understand, him and Roman soldiers don't get along together. And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, that's pretty cool, one that yadeth with God, and of a good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel 
to send for thee unto his house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them and certain brethren. He didn't go by himself. He took six men with him. Why? Because there's three of them. So he brought six brethren with him. Just to be on the safe side. <laughs> six other Jews. <laughs> Just in case. From Joppa accompanied him. Okay? Now watch. On the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius was waiting for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. That's intense. And as, as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Now, what are you going to do when someone does that to you? Someone falls down at your feet. Remember, that's what people did to the apostles, right? They put their feet. That means here, my thoughts, however you want me, whatever you want me to do. So they came, he came in and, and put his head at Peter's feet. Well, Peter's not the best example, or haven't you noticed? <laughs> and I'm not the best example. The best example is who? Christ, right? Does that make sense? And Peter was, okay, and worshipped him. And Peter took him up, saying, stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. So he walks into the person's house, and it's packed with people. These are friends, relatives, associates. I know. And he said unto them, you know that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come on to one of another nation. Why? Remember when Jesus said, the, the centurion said to him, my, my servant is sick. Which happened, the servant had to be Jewish. And, and uh, would you come, would you heal him? And Jesus says, well, I'm on my way to heal him. And the centurion goes, no, you don't come under the roof of my house. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. Remember that? Because the servant knew. That's what I'm saying. All the centurions were from the Anatolia region and the Palestine region. They were... Those of the region spoke, because you'll notice that when Peter speaks to them, they're not having a problem with it. They don't need a translator. Now, there's times we do need a translator, but not while Peter's speaking to the centurion. Because centurions have an attitude that everybody has to speak to them in Latin. And these centurions speak to everybody in Aramaic. That means they're from that area. They don't need a translator. So when Peter speaks to them, they're speaking together as if it was common. And when Paul speaks of him, he calls him Cephas, which is an Aramaic term for Peter. So we're talking about this whole centurion thing. And when Paul's talking to them, he's speaking to them, not in Latin, but he's speaking to them in Aramaic. So that means they have to know the language. And generally, the Romans could care less about Aramaic. They can't speak Latin and cut off their head. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. But the Anatolian, uh, yeah, that, that, that group of centurions were much better. But anyway, and he says, no, that it's unlawful for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Why? Because from the word of God's point of view, they are what? Gentiles. And Gentiles are what? Dogs. Okay. But God has shown me. Now we come back to that revelation. Remember, God gave him doctrine. God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Mm -hmm. Wow. Therefore, I came on to you without gainsaying. I didn't waste any time. As soon as I was asked, sent for, I asked, therefore, for what intent have you sent for me? Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting, which means committed to only God, nothing else, which is what Peter was doing on the, on the rooftop. Until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And so, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thy alms are had remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. 
he is lodged in the house of one Simon the Tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent for thee, and thou hast done well that thou art come. Now, therefore, we are all here, we're all here and present before God to hear all things that are commanded of thee of God. Does anyone understand that, that that's what you are? Have you ever walked into a place and have someone throw themselves at your feet and bow down to you? Not yet. It happened to me twice. Almost a third time, but I stopped them. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> wait, wait until Christ returns. Then you can do it. <laughs> Not me. Right? Do you understand? When people recognize, especially when, you, when God works with you to bring forth a miracle, that's when it's intense because everybody thinks it's you. Then they grab you and say, oh, go heal this person too. Go heal that. It doesn't work like that. If God don't tell you, then what do you do? You don't do anything. You and I don't control God. We follow what he says. Well, God should heal me. Yeah, just like the sorrow for an Asian woman. Okay. We get healed when we align our thinking, our perspective, our value systems with who? God's thoughts and images. That's how we get healed. And it heals from the inside out, and it's permanent. Now, therefore, we are all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of who? God. And that's hot. So, guess what Peter do? Now, I want you to, when you talk to Christians, people call themselves that. They always sit there and you say, well, how did you get to be a Christian? They go, Romans 10, 9, and 10. Have you ever read yeah. Romans 10, 9, and 10? That's all I know, Romans 10, 9, and 10. So let's go in there, and I want to see how this works. Romans 10, 9, and 10. There are two groups in the, in the first century. There's the, what, Jew and the Gentile, correct. So we have to keep in mind what part of the Bible is written to Jews, what part is written to the Gentiles. So let's go to Romans chapter 10, which is right after 9, right? Romans 10, 9. And it says in Romans 10, 9, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Is that true? It is to whom it is written. Let's go into chapter, we're in chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is they might be saved. For I bear them record. Who was he talking to? The Jews at Rome. Got it? So chapter 10 is he's speaking specifically to the Jews. So is this going to be how people that are Gentiles? Is this the word of God to them? No. no. This is chapter 10 verse, all of chapter 10, including 10, 9, and 10. It's written to the Jews. What's the difference? We're about to find out. So watch carefully, because is Cornelius a good man? Yeah. Is he a good man? Is he not called the horn? The just unbending, committed, directed, faithful, committed, I mean, you name it. He, he's the example. So now watch what Peter, now, now here's watch. Watch what the words are. Then Peter opened his mouth. Now when you see this phrase, opened his mouth, when you speak in tongues, what's the first thing you do? You don't think about it. You just open your mouth and start. Do you understand? By the lips of thy prophet David. He just opened. And you see David open his mouth. That's when revelation comes in. You see it with Abraham. You see it with Moses. This phrase lets you know, or when they looked up and they saw. That's all revelation. This is a revelation phrase. 
So Peter's about to speak by the what? Spirit, by revelation to them. So this is a message directly from God through Peter to them. So how many of you ever, people say, go, people freak out when you talk to them. And they think, oh my God, how did you know? Or, oh, you know, they, everybody thinks that we're so special. It's not we're so special, it's God's so special. Does that make any sense? All right. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, now here, this is all revelation to who? Romans 10, 9, 10 is written to the what? The Jews. This is, this is a what? Gentile. This is God's word spoken by Peter from God to Gentiles. How many here are, how many here are not Jews? Right? So what is it that made us take that step over? Here we go. Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation hear that yadeth him, and worketh what? you got to know the word to be able to work righteousness. It's accepted with him. The word which God sent on the children of who? Israel, preaching peace by Jesus the anointed, that he is Lord of all. That word I say you know, which was published throughout all Judea, began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. You ready for it? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Now, why is it, what, where's the word Christ? That's what this word is. Here they didn't translate it Christ, they just translated it anointed. The word Christos and anointing is the same word. And sometimes the translators said anointing, and sometimes they said Christ. That's why it's Christ in you, or is it the anointing in you? Both. Both. <laughs> that anointing in Christ is where? In you. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, that's that word that's Christos, which means anointed, which is translated Christ for some reason, with the Holy Spirit, so God anoints him, not with oil, but with what? Mm-hmm. And with power. Who, talking about Jesus, went about doing good? Who was doing good? Was he good or was he doing good? Doing good. That's exactly what it says. Jesus says there's none good but who? God. So he was doing God's will. So he was doing good. And healing all that were oppressed to the devil. For God, we're talking about Jesus here. For God was what? Yeah, God was with him. Where's God now? They point to each other. He's over there. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Where's God? That's right. <laughs> Bingo. And the crowd goes wild. Okay. And we are all witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hang on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but unto witnesses, chosen before God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Do you see any difference between that and Romans? What's the difference between that and Romans? Getting up from the dead and eating and drinking. It's not in Romans 10.9. It's only written to the Jews, because the Jews, the Jews, the Jews know that when you're dead, it's over. You don't live on. But Gentiles believe it is. That's why you've got to say that Jesus died, was raised from the dead in a physical body, and ate and drank. That's not in Romans 10.9. It is here, because this is to be given to the what? Gentiles. And then one, the first one to be given this, Cornelius. Why? Because he is extraordinary. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and testify that it is he which is ordained of God to be the judge of the quick, which means living, and the dead. Why? Because he's been both. And you have to be able to have been through something to be able to judge that. Has he been living? Yes. Has he died? Yes. Is he alive again? Yes. So he's the perfect judge. 
To him give all the prophets witness. How far back? All the way back to Genesis. And through his name, whosoever believeth on him should receive remission, which means a total non-existence of that which is deficient. Sin. It says sin, but it just means deficient. While Peter yet spoke these words, what words? That Jesus died and rose and ate and drank. That's what's different between that and Romans. While yet Peter spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell on them, which heard the word. That's everybody in that room. And they of the circumcision, which believed, were astonished, as many which came with Peter. So that's Peter and the six brethren. Because they're on the Gentiles, Cornelius and all the band of renowns there, was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. There says Holy Ghost, Pneuma Hagio, and Holy Spirit. For reason. This is how they knew they had the Spirit. For they heard them what? Amen. Recite verses. No. <laughs> Say amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. No. For they heard them what? And magnify God. Isn't that cool? Ah, there we go, ready? Ah, now we come to a thorn. Pricky pinky. Right. <laughs> then, temporal connective, answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? What's going on? Number one, how many times, if you're Jewish, do you get water baptized? Now, I'm not talking about shower. I'm not talking about bath. That's where you get in there and you have someone of, you know, Pharisee or Sadducee or a Levite actually grab your bow your day, your body, and get you into the water, hold you down, and then have lift you up. You do it when you're born. They actually put you in the water and have you go, oh, when you're born. So you actually come out of the womb and go right in the water and then pull you out. Baptism of birth. What's the second one? When you're 13. Then you go for your bar mitzvah. For women it's called a bat mitzvah. But for men it's a bar mitzvah. And then what's the next one? When you become 30. I'm almost there. I'm lying. I've already been there. <laughs> and then you get married. That's four. And the last one is when you're dead. And that's why the women came and bathed him when Jesus died. Because Joseph Marathia just wrapped him in a sin dome. And Nicodemus pulled him back out. The women were there after that. So everybody had to bathe him and clean him up and make him smell good. That's why when, he, when, they, when they went in there, that he had them all wrapped up in grave clothes rather than just in the sin dome. Nicodemus pulled him out and wrapped him up like a mummy. Like, the, like what you do with a newborn babe, you do that, then you undo it. So when you die, you put you back in that same situation. So this was, see, I can imagine Jesus going, after he raised him, he's like, all right, well, who did this? <laughs> because he was supposed to be just put in a sheet and rolled over, like what Nicod that was the plan. But no. So he finally got out, and, he's, and you can see that he just took the face cloth and went like, what? And he sat down. He wasn't supposed to be wrapped in a, in a freaking ortholium, which is the bandages. That was Nicodemus' is doing, and the women. <laughs> they wanted to clean him up and stuff like that. But they didn't actually go in the tomb. They came, were waiting, and he'd already been risen. But anyway... And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed he then to tarry certain days. Well, the problem was, are they Jewish? No. Were they baptized on the birth? No. Were they baptized when they were 30? No. So why they, what good will water do now? They're not Jewish. So now we jump into chapter 11, verse 1 through 3. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision, the Jews, 
contended with him, saying, Thou wentest into a, to men uncircumcised? Oh! And did eat with them? Oh! Kind of dumb. This is where it begins. Do people, the Jewish community, cannot accept that anyone else can be right with God, and they did not like the idea that someone who wasn't Jewish received the Spirit. And number two, he's a Roman citizen, received the Spirit. Number three, he's a centurion. These are all bad things from a, Roman, from a Jewish point of view. So they did not like what Peter did. And they didn't want him doing it again. That's why Peter never did it again. That's why God couldn't get him out there because he didn't want to upset any of the other people. This is where the problem comes in. You're going to have to upset people. I'm sorry. Frank, have you ever upset people? You have to understand what is your God. Is it the world or is it the God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the question. What's at stake? Well, the world, the word says that everybody is dead in trespasses and sins. And that sounds so religious. As, you know what it means? That everybody's dead? God sees the what? End from the beginning. What's the end? The resurrection. If they don't make it in the resurrection, what are they? They stay what? That's all it means. They don't get up from the dead. Now, I have, you know, it's like, oh, I won't be alone if I die. No, that doesn't, that's stupid. I mean, really dumb. I just don't want to stay dead. I don't mind dying. I just want to stay there. Got it? I've seen death. I don't like it. I don't want to stay there. I don't mind visiting. I just want to stay there. Kind of like Disneyland, you know. <laughs> oh, and you ate with them? Oh. You know, I kind of think. Well, okay. I over-exaggerate here, but basically. So now we go back to, we all jump into now, we're going to jump into, uh, like, we're just going to jump 12 more verses. And I want to show you, as he recounts what happened to the other Jews. And as he began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them. He's talking what happened. Watch carefully. My hand will not leave my wrist. All right. <laughs> fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, what Jesus spoke, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So the question is, when he told them, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed that they, they prayed him to tarry certain days. Well, he stayed certain days, but then he what? Remembered. So did he baptize them? Nope. No, no, no mojado, no soaky soaky, no ducky ducky, dunky dunky, nope. So this becomes interesting. So what baptism, how many baptisms are there? There's only what? One. And that's by the Holy Spirit or no deal. Water don't do anything. Does that make your skin wrinkly? You ever know that? You ever sit in a tub? Come out and look like a prune? <laughs> All right. I look like a... <laughs> so now he says, Then remembered I the word of the Lord. He was there for three days. He gave that commandment. Then he turned around and backed out of it. Then remember I the Lord how that John... So what's the subject matter here? Baptized. What's the subject matter here? Baptized. With what? Water. That's John's baptism. But they've already received the Spirit. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, which they did. So which is it? Which is more valuable, water or spirit? You know, I was so Roman Catholicly 
endowed or and you know overwhelmed growing up in it that I I couldn't speak in tongues unless someone hit me with water. So I had to, the guy says, you're really serious? I go, yeah, I need to have someone pray over me and throw water on my face. So I, they go, okay. <laughs> That's what they did. <laughs> they took me in the bathroom, turned on the sink, and went, here, touch your head back. Okay, you're all set now. Let's go. <laughs> go speak in tongues. <laughs> like, I know. It's like, so if someone says, well, I can't speak in tongues unless I, I get Bathe, I get baptized in, in soy sauce or, or salsa. That, I'm going to have some salsa standing by. Let me, give me a heads up so I have it ready. Here you go. <laughs> you understand how silly this is? What is it, spirit or is it water? Someone says, well, I just, if we just had a baby. I want, I want you to water baptize him. I want you to baptize him. I said, he doesn't know who Jesus is. He doesn't even speak English yet. There's no way he knows that God raised him. He's not going to make any sense. Why am I doing that? What would you want me to do that for? Well, it, it just makes us feel better. Like, no, no. Wait till he's 12 and I'll, we'll get him all right. But you can't. You can't. There's nothing. People say, well, you got to get that sin out of there. There's no sin in there. <laughs> Newborn babe, where's the sin in there? I can understand when, when you change some of the diapers. Well, there's got to be something in there. <laughs> but aside from that, no, it just means ignorance. And how many people, how many newborn babes are totally ignorant of God's will? All of them. So, how many adults are? That's beside the point. Okay. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed in the Lord Jesus, who was I that I should withstand who? Concerning what? Baptism. Baptism. What was he wanted to do? Water baptism. And they've already, it's like saying, well, you got to go to elementary school. I just graduated from college. No, you got to go back to elementary school. Like, what? No. Water baptism went with John. Spiritual baptism is with Christ. So, is that making sense? Everybody set with that? And some of you have got the most beautiful tongues. I'm saying, when you speak in tongues, it just blesses me so much. I can just sit there and listen to you all day long. Wow. Beautiful. I'm not saying mine isn't, but, you know, like hearing you speak in tongues. And some people... Some people, you, you look at them like, I wonder what their tongue sounds like when they speak in tongues. I have someone who's like, you know, he speaks, the person speaks in tongues and it sounds like Chinese. And they're not Chinese at all. <laughs> it's like, wow, amazing. So anyway, baptism with the Holy Ghost. For as much as God gave them like gift as he done to us. So what's in you is the same that's in who? Peter. So if God's going to talk, if someone goes to praise to God, and God does talk to him, what's he going to do? Send them to you. Got it? Well, I don't know enough. Well, if God sends you to them, or sends you to them, or them to you, then obviously you know enough. But if you have problems, give me a call. You can call me anything you'd like. Well, maybe not. Anyway. So I'm not going to withstand God. I'm not going to water or baptize anybody. And Paul didn't either. Got it? So water baptism is totally unnecessary. If they still want water baptism, they don't know enough word yet. But if it really gets down to it and they want to but they can't, then just go ahead and take them in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Where would you like to be baptized at? <laughs> Exceptional man, is he not? No. Just focused. Committed. Straight. I, had, I went through like a hundred pictures and I had the, uh, I guess a composite of people from that area. And um, to find the right facial features and stuff, it's kind of cool. But that is Cornelius, the horn of fire. Now, does everybody understand why it's called the horn of fire now? 
Now you understand when you read Daniel about the horns, the seven horns, so you'll understand what that's talking about. Or when you get in Revelations, you hear about the horns, that's what that's talking about. That's nothing to do with real horns. So is everybody blessed? How many here have access to God? You all better raise your hand. All right, thank you. <laughs> you all have access to God. So how do you hear from God? When you align your heart and your soul and your mind to see from God's perspective, see yourself that way, and all of a sudden, bang, you get it. And you get some, and usually it comes in the form of a what? A vision. And, it's, and it all contains the word, right? Well, Father, I thank you for each person's life here that they can be in tune to your call, to manifest your power and your authority, to manifest your healing, to manifest your truth, that the world may see that they are your dwelling place. So for their lives and for all the great things we're yet to do and accomplish, Father, we give you all the praise and glory as you hold us within your shadow and take our hand and help us to truly walk in the footsteps of your firstborn from the dead, our risen and returned Lord Jesus. Your anointing. You are God's what? Best. Best. Mwah.